Welcome everyone to the Brighter Wealth Show. My name is David Sandu. I'm a financial advisor and at Brighter Wealth, we help Christians become brighter stewards of God's wealth. Really excited to have uh, Taylor Stanridge on the show. Uh, welcome Taylor to the Brighter Wealth Show. Man, David, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm, it's good to meet you. I didn't know we were so close together in terms of like geography. I mean, you're in Fort Worth, I'm in Dallas. Yeah, DFW is like a, it's like kind of like Houston, though. You uh, takes you a few hours to get across the Metroplex. It's weird that you can drive three hours and still be in Dallas. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So it, it's nuts how many, like there's what, 8 million people in DFW. Like that's like 16 times the population of Wyoming. So yeah, it's just nuts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I'm excited today. We have a we have a few different topics that we're going to talk about. Uh, the first one being our work as worship. But for people that are not familiar with uh, who you are, if you just want to share kind of what your what you do and kind of what your journey is, uh, I know we talked a little bit on the pre call just about uh, your journey through um, Dallas Theological Seminary. So yeah, just share a little bit about who you are. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not not super exciting of a person, but uh, I'm I'm a radio broadcaster in Dallas, Fort Worth. I work at KCBI Radio, so that's a Christian radio station that we get the the chance to broadcast to over 300,000 people a week. Uh, and so we I've been doing that for about six years at KCBI. I've been in radio for about 10 years. Uh, so I started around 19 years old, and so. Um, just really been interested in biblical finance as I got exposed to people like Dave Ramsey, Ron Blue, Larry Burkett. And then I got uh, exposed to Art Rayner and Art Rayner actually became a good friend of mine so much so that I ended up producing his podcast. And then I ended up becoming a co-host of his podcast. So uh, now I'm co-host of a podcast called More Than Money with Art Rayner. And we even have a Facebook group if you'd like to join that. Um, and that's just a group where we ask questions. We find out how we can be better stewards. You know, the, the slogan is live, uh, give generously, save wisely, live appropriately. You know, really encouraging people to pursue God's design for money. And so i um, been doing that. And I also got convicted about a few years ago, really wanting to dive deeper into the scriptures, learning who God is, what he, what his word actually says. And so I'm a second year student at Dallas Theological Seminary, post uh, pursuing a degree in uh, apologetics and evangelism. Something I'm really passionate about is uh, having conversations with people who have intellectual doubts about our faith. Uh, and also just, you know, having those conversations of evangelism, sharing our faith through our, our life. And I, I love this subject, work is worship. You know, I, mm. I love that topic. Just, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of people that think it's just all about our words and it's, it's about our actions too. You know, we really don't have to show people through our words as much as show them through our actions. Now, words are important because faith comes by hearing, uh, mm. but our words are useless if our actions don't display that. Uh, yeah. So that's that's me. I've got a I've got a wife that I've been married to for six years. Um, I have a seven month old son, so I stay pretty busy <laughs> with the a, a baby at home and seminary yeah. education. Yeah. So I, I've been doing this for a few years, uh, coordinating FBU classes here and there. Um, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be here, David. That's awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for being here. One of the uh, one of the, obviously you get to integrate your faith with your work uh, every day, which is amazing. And, and the topic for today is wor our work as worship. I want to start off uh, Colossians 3.23 says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. How do you integrate, you know, your, I mean, obviously with being on a Christian radio show, you know, how are you integrating your faith um, and integrating your work as worship? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's pretty simple with uh, a Christian radio ministry. You know, we're, we're out, you know, working with organizations. Like right now we're doing something with a shoe drive where we're getting shoes for kids here in DFW. Uh, but we also do some international work. Uh, we were working with uh, Texas Baptist men when it came to Ukraine. Uh, so it's really easy to do good work with KCBI, uh, but primarily it's through the, the content that we talk about on the air. So we're encouraging mm. people, reminding them who God is, why he is good and why we can trust him. Mm. Uh, and I do that through podcasting, audio editing, uh, blogging, writing. Uh, so it's, it's really simple with me. Uh, I've been in Christian radio since 2019, uh, not 2019, since 2013. So it's, it's been easy for me to integrate my faith into my work, but I'm jealous of those who have a non-Christian workplace. Uh, Tell because me why. I, I really, well, because I, I don't get to have conversations with non-Christians that much. Hmm. Uh, and and I'm, I really seek that. So when I have non-Christians over at my house or I meet people out in, in person, I love those conversations because I'm not speaking to the choir. You know, like hmm. they're actually asking really good questions. And I love having those conversations and I don't feel the desire to seal the deal or, you know, uh, close, you know, close the sale of Christianity. If yeah. you will. But, uh, 
I, I, I love the this seed. question. Planting the seed, you know, Jesus, you know, when he talks about reaping and sowing, he's actually focusing on the sower, mm-hmm. you know, because he's saying, uh, you know, you've, you're reaping all the benefits of, of the work that's been done before you. This work is not work that you've done. And so mm-hmm. he's really praising this, uh, the sower in that parable. And so I really, I really love the opportunity to, to talk more with people. And I hope I get to, uh, on a, on a more regular basis, but you know, that's kind of one of the downfalls of working in Christian ministry. You're not mm. as exposed to non-Christians as you'd like to be, but that's why I'm pursuing a degree mm. in that. So I can get better at that and be more, uh, biblically wise in how I approach that. Yeah. I think, you know, so, you know, my, my previous career was, I was a rocket scientist for a little over a decade before I started right. in the financial services industry. And, you know, being in that environment, I, I traveled a lot overseas and, and had opportunities to be around, obviously, non-Christians. But also, yeah. I lived in Israel for a few years, and I got to experience, you know, traditional Judaism and got to just hear their story. And it was just, it's just so interesting how um, their their uh, life and their faith are so intertwined and interconnected. It's not a, oh, I'm going to pray now, and that's my Christian thing to do. It's just, it is involved so heavily inside of their culture. Uh, even, you know, taking the Sabbath and, and being, you know, quote unquote, religious about things. Sure. Uh, they, but they really integrate their their life and their work and their faith. Um, but, but one of the things that I did notice is, you know, sometimes it's hard for us in, in two different areas as Christians, right? We're in this world, but we're not of this world. Mm-hmm. But as Christians, right, and especially for, for people in secular jobs that are not, not not talking to Christians or on a regular basis, right? How do we how do we start that conversation so that we can really use our our business as a ministry or our work as a mission field? Yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be that awkward. You want me to tell you about Jesus? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's, not yeah. that, it's not that conversation. Honestly, you have to let that naturally come into come into play. Mm-hmm. You know, so uh, that's going to happen because the Christian life is meant to take. You know, it's meant to be a light. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, if, even if you think of Old Testament Israel, the law that they had was not necessarily like it wasn't. <laughs> God punishing them so they had more rules than everybody else. No, the the law was meant so that other nations could see how Israel was different. Mm-hmm. That's how Christians are to be in the workplace. You know, so whether it's our work ethic or it's our viewpoint on the things in this world, like the the events going on. But mm-hmm. like I think honestly, one of the best things that we can do as Christians, especially during the pandemic that we had, was just having this non anxious presence. Mm-hmm. You know, not necessarily uh, this presence that refuses to be. Uh, you know, that refuses to acknowledge what's happening, but it's one that refuses to be shaped by it. Mm. So I think honestly, having those honest conversations, letting them come to you, but also asking them what they believe, you know, I I think a lot of people genuinely love to share about themselves and and love to share what they believe. And as long as you don't make this awkward conversation of, you know, well, I'd, I'd I'd love to tell you what I believe, you know, like, like we call it relational equity, develop that relational equity. And I promise you, they're going to want to, they're, they're going to want to hear what you believe. They may not agree with it, but mm-hmm. you can at least have that relationship with them. I, you know, I, I'm not a fan of the door to door salesman tactic, you know, because, you know, if you, you treat Jesus like he's a product, they're going to treat him the same way. Yeah. Um, so that's, that, that's to me, you know, whether it's through our work ethics, the way that we treat our coworkers, it's the mm-hmm. way that we react to the world events happening that are affecting our jobs. Uh, I think we can stand out more than we know. Um, yeah. And I think taking a step back, right, if we think about work as a construct that God has designed for us, right, mm-hmm. then we, we don't necessarily view work in a negative light, right? We can view our work as a glory to God, right? So there there's opportunities, right? So even even in, when I was, you know, uh, working for, for space companies, we the, I, I was kind of, quote unquote, the money nerd, right? So I always had this passion around money and and uh, stewardship and so people had asked me it just kind of come the conversation would come up around like oh what do you think you know about this 401k or investment account and i would integrate i would start talking about well you know i you know first i give to my church and then it kind of opens the door so i don't think it has to be so unorganic right it can be a little bit more organic in that you you're just you're just being authentic about your faith yeah. and how and how god is a priority in your life but i want to i want to talk first initially about how how should we view work right forget about what we're doing but how should we even view work as worship yeah so a lot of us make the mistake of thinking that work is somehow a punishment of the fall um but yeah if we look at the timeline of genesis uh work was pre-fall it was pre-sin mm. we were called to steward the earth and take care of what god created and that doesn't change because of sin you know we 
we we steward the earth and that looks differently now that we have different companies and jobs but i, I still right. think we have a, a responsibility to steward the earth be responsible stewards of everything that god has given us so mm. that includes all of our resources that includes our animals that are, includes our families our mm. our wealth our time our relationships it includes all that we steward and so uh work mm. is not something that's going to stop when we die there's actually going yeah. to be work in the afterlife and it's going to work it's going to look differently when we're not going to work for an income mm. like you know that's the result of the fall that we have to now work and and work against the earth essentially <laughs> you know yeah. it's, it's, it's hard it's it's uh it's detrimental but uh work now in the afterlife will be for, and it should still be for the glory of God, but it's going to be purely for the glory of God. And so just like Colossians 3 said, yeah. you know, we we work not for human masters. Yeah. Uh, and I think those who have had a bad boss before or have had a, a toxic work environment, that can be very uh, hard to swallow. And I'm not saying those who leave jobs for that reason are, are disobeying God in that sense. I've, I've had to do that before. Mm. Um but I think it changes your perspective. You see them through the lens of God's eyes. And mm. I think that that changes everything. Yeah. And I think I, I've said this before, but I, I can't remember who said this, but it, it, a lot of times Christians will view our, our lives as a dot instead of the line that is eternity. And mm. I think when we are working, right? So Colossians, like you mentioned, Colossians 3 talks about we'll receive our inheritance from the Lord, right? Are we yeah. doing this work for for these earthly people are we, or are we doing this work for the Lord? Yeah. The other thing that comes to mind there is, if I'm doing this work for the Lord, then would he be pleased in the job that I'm doing? And, sure. and am I doing it with excellence? I think a lot of times as Christians, you know, when it comes to money or finances or, or our work, right, we kind of take this like approach of like, well, let me just do enough to get by, right? Just to get, you know, living sure. for the paycheck, right? That's a common theme uh, that, that people kind of, you know, out in the world will talk about and just living for the paycheck or living from paycheck to paycheck. Um, but a lot of times we're not actually viewing our, our life and our work in light of eternity, right? Like, will 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 god be pleased right yeah. when i give an account will god be pleased will he say well done good and faithful servant or will he say man you really messed up like you did not do a good job in the work that i had that i had given you to do right it reminds me of the scripture uh he who does not provide uh for his family is worse than he has denied his faith right he's worse than an unbeliever sure. and and the bible also says he who doesn't work doesn't eat so i think you know we can take those scriptures as um, you know, obviously at the base level, we need to provide income for our family, but God says that he has denied his faith, right? It's like, I need to view this work as an opportunity to be a blessing, not only to my family, but also to the people around me, right? To talk a little bit about how can we be a blessing to the people around us, especially for those people that are in, you know, uh, secular jobs that don't necessarily have, um, you know, the Christian coworkers or Christian the people that we can talk about our faith to, uh, openly. Yeah, I think um, Paul David Tripp was on our uh, podcast a few weeks back and then a few years back, and uh, he pointed out something to Art and I that just changed my view on this forever. Ephesians 4.28, uh, it's right before Ephesians 4.29, very popular verse about being careful with our words, not letting mm -hmm. our uh, speech tear people down. But Ephesians 4.28 is a key money verse, and mm -hmm. it talks about let, let not a thief steal no more, let him work with his hands. And then if you look in the original Greek, uh, of, of the language there. There's an imperative there. And, and the imperative basically says, this is why you work. This mm. is why it's here. And it says, so that he may have something to share with those mm. in need. So it really represents that our work is, the main purpose for our work is to share with mm. others. It's generosity. Now, I, I heard a story from a professor recently, and he was uh, he was talking to the pastor, and the pastor was visiting somebody uh, who was not visiting, who wasn't going to church lately. He had mm. he had not been in like six months. And the pastor just wanted to check on him, and you know the church member was like, "I know what this conversation is about." <laughs> um, but the pastor was essentially saying, "Hey, we we missed you at church today," uh, and and the guy's like, "Yeah, I know. I'm just really tired. I, I worked so hard all week. I just want to have the weekend to relax." And he's like, "Well, why do you work so hard?" He's like, what do you mean? I gotta, I gotta have a, I gotta have, you know, someone's gotta live, right? And he's like, who, who told you that? <laughs> and it was, it was a really bold response. The pastor was making the idea, look, you don't provide for your needs. God does. Mm -hmm. Now he yeah. provides for our needs through work, but God is the one that provides for your needs. And if your work is, and that, that's a healthy story about, you know, not working so much, not working mm. too much. You know, we often think of work, it has to be the eight to five, 40 hour Americanized 
you know, 20th century industrial revolution type of thing. <laughs> you know, it has to be this this way, but that's not the way that work looked. Uh, it, you know, work is, is not about, um, you know, trusting in ourselves. It's mm. about uh, relishing in what God has given us. It's relishing and yeah. participating in what God has given us. Yeah, and this this reminds me of the story in uh, in Tim Ferriss's uh, For Our Work Week when he talks about the Mexican fisherman and the investment banker. And for yeah. those who haven't heard the story, I'm not going to get into all the details. But basically, the gist of it is why delay for you know in 20 years what you could be doing now. And sure. it, and it really brings to mind the scripture where Jesus talks about give us this day our daily bread, right? The Lord's prayer. It's like man. Are we trusting God for just today? And it also brings back to memory when the uh, when the Israelites are wondering, and they can't actually, you know, store up food for the next day because it starts to spoil. And I just yeah. think, man, God, how what would it really look like, right, for us to trust you like the sparrow does, who does who just trusts you that like today you will give us enough provision for today. And if I'm viewing my work, like I said, in light of eternity, you know, is this job my source? Am I putting my hope? in yeah. these riches? Am I putting my hope in this job? Am I putting my hope in, in in this employer? Right? There's almost like this, I don't know about arrogance, but pride or, or there's something that that's taking our eyes off of God and using our work as an idol. I know we talked about this before, but you know, even the financial independence movement has some good, good and bad things about it. But you know, the financial independence movement, I think the motivation, it just depends on, are you motivated by your income? to produce more and to, to generate more so that you can, um, you know, not have to work anymore? Or are you, are you motivated to do that so that you can be generous and, and willing to yeah. share and willing to serve? So I think it just really depends on our heart framework. Yeah. I think if you look at the life of the apostle Paul, um, you know, he was a rabbi. So rabbis had to choose a trade. And so he was a tent maker, but Paul wasn't making tents all the time. Paul made, you know, provided for his own needs. And then he went and, you know, went to all the churches and wrote all the letters, you know, Paul, I think Paul understood that quite well. He worked with he worked for what he needed, and then he went off. But he he never stopped working. He just mm. you know he he had a good perspective on that. It was it, it like ha, being financially independent allowed him to to do his work with all the churches. So that, mm. that it was really neat. So it's all about the heart there. So yeah, yeah. I definitely uh, appreciate those who uh, can go into financial independence knowing that. I mean, we, we're just talking about Sabbath. Uh, you know, the Israelites you now yeah. not being able to work, and that's a terrifying thought, right? Mm. I mean, uh, they can't gather up food for themselves on the seventh day and they can't gather up more than they need and this was teaching them look i'm the one that provides for this and you would think mm. bread falling from the sky would be proof enough to trust in yeah. god but this was actually really hard because it wasn't mm. just every seventh day it was every seven years they had to take a year off and mm. then every 49 years they had to take another year off so mm. every seven seven years mm. so you think the 49th and the 50th year they were taking two years in a row off not working mm. like that's nuts that's ultimate trust in god yeah, that's like redefining the sabbatical for uh, for a lot of Americans. Huge sabbatical. <laughs> I think I th it's so it's so interesting. I, I was I was comparing or I was talking about the parable of the man who is, you know, has these fields and he's storing up and got and Jesus says, you know, you're you're a fool. God says you're a fool because your soul is going to be required of you tonight. And then someone reminded me of Joseph in the storehouses, right? And and he was able to, for seven years, store up food and grain. And he literally was able to save a nation, you yeah. know, to do that. So both of them built storehouses, but the purpose and the motivation was different in both of those stories. And I think, Absolutely. you know, as Christians, again, we're, we're looking at, at our life, n not often in light of eternity. We're just kind of getting into this you know, it could be a side gig or the hustle, hustle culture, right? Yep. That we're like, Hey, we got to do this. We've got to compete. We've got to, we've got to be as good as all these other people. Why is it so hard for us as Christians to just rest and trust God? Man, it, I, I think more so this is an American thing because mm. you mentioned the hustle culture and there's so many books on this. Uh, Daniel Im wrote a great book called you are what you do and six other lies that you believe. Uh, there's also uh, To Hell with Hustle, Jefferson Beck. There's John Mark Comer, who says the ruthless elimination of hurry. Hmm. Uh, we, are, we are in this culture that idolizes productivity. Like every, hmm. and, and I'm not saying productivity is bad. I think maximizing your time is, is great. But I think we, we misalign ourselves with the purpose of life. And that's what you, that, that's what you quoted in the, the parable of the guy who's building the bigger barns. Hmm. He mistook the fact that he's not in control of his own life. You're building mm. all these barns for what? You could die tomorrow. Mm. What on earth are you storing barns for? Now, this is different than somebody saving for retirement. You know, this is 
providing for family. This is providing an inheritance in, if necessary. So that, those are all biblical things. Those are all things that we can uh, encourage. But we're not building bigger barns. We're not saying, oh, look at all my money. I can, you know, this is essentially lifestyle creep in the Bible. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, Fucking look at me. I can rest and be married. He's like, you don't have to wait for that. Mm. Uh, so I, I think we can rest in God. And there's so many businesses too that like they have to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. There's some there's some businesses that just don't need to. So mm. what, what what's what's wrong with having a business of six employees, being successful in the community, mm. and just doing that? Yeah. You know, being enough to pay your bills, have a good amount of profit, being able to fix things and and grow slightly. It doesn't have to be this millionaire game. Like what's yeah. what's wrong with that? We, we've misaligned ourselves and think that it's all about money. It's all about achievement. But in reality, nobody, nobody actually cares. Yeah, <laughs> like, that, that's very I true. I, I was uh, uh, praying about this this morning about, you know, as Christians and, and as, fin- as a financial advisor, right? A lot of times people will be looking to say, hey, what's my, you know, I'm tracking my net worth and is, is it growing and is it getting bigger? Sure. And this is a hard, this is hard being a Christian, you know, it's, it's not hard, but it, it, it's just a conversation that we have to have being a Christian financial advisor, being a, being a kingdom advisor, right? How are we spurring those who are a people of the faith to, to, to be generous? And, and I'm not saying tracking your net worth is a bad thing, no, but, not at all. but what if we started tracking our net given, right? And how mm-hmm. much we're in, can we increase our, the, the giving that we're doing in, in our generosity. What if we started tracking how generous we were as Christians, right? Cause it, it seems, I mean, I, from the, from the scriptures, it seems like Christians should be some of the most generous people on the planet. They should, in my opinion. So, um, give us some practical things. I mean, one of the things I think for, for viewing our work as worship, obviously I think should be generosity, generosity to our employer, generosity to our coworkers, right? How can we be a blessing to them looking for opportunities to, you know, maybe go the extra mile, right? And, and do, do maybe try to do more work uh, or do it with more excellence maybe than some of the people around us might be doing it. Um, what are some other practical ways that we can really view our work as worship, but really put it into application? Yeah, I think servant leadership is another one. You know, mm-hmm. uh, not not now. This is different than you know having boundaries. Uh, you know, somebody struggles with getting too much work put on their plate. This is different than that. Mm-hmm. I want to say somebody who has the time to serve other people. You know, you don't have to always say that's not my job. You can you can take up that slack and help people. You know, we mm-hmm. we're a body, and you can think of your company as a body. You know, when when one person's struggling, you can be that that arm or that leg that takes mm-hmm. on the slack until they get back to normal. Because you know, if you're struggling, you'd like them to do the same. And so I think servant leadership, just realizing like, uh, you don't have to condemn people who uh, are not doing their job very well. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. They could be yeah. doing of one being lost, you know, a lot of that happened with COVID. Uh, you know, we just don't know what's going on behind the scenes. So treating them, treating them like that, like you would want to be treated in that scenario is is so key. And I think that's going to stand out in your faith. Uh, also, just having an excellent work ethic uh, and having uh, having excellence in your product that you're making. You know, really, really getting in down to the into the details and really um, doing your due diligence. I mm. think often. Uh, we can get so tired that we we skip corners. But once again, this is all about mindset here. Mm. You know, are we serving the Lord? And if I gave this to the Lord, if the Lord gave me this project, would I be happy with the product? Yeah. Or would I just say, you know, he ain't going to notice. Oh, but it's God. <laughs> he will notice. Yeah. So I think just always, always having that perspective there. Uh, I, yeah. I think it's really key. And I, I honestly, the most godly people I know have been people in leadership who've just taken on the slack. You know, the, the people that, uh, you know, they might be a CEO or they might be a general manager and they're doing like something that like um, an hourly employee would do. Mm. That has always stood out to me and, mm. and, and to, it still stands out to me today. So if you can do that in your workplace, if you can remember people's names, have intentional conversations, uh, I, I think you're going to stand out quite well. Yeah, that's that's really good. That that ties perfectly into our second topic. Uh, the topic here is our role as stewards. And I want to just talk uh, talk about First Timothy 6. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will uh, store up for themselves uh, as a firm foundation a treasure for the coming age, so that they may take hold of, of that which is truly life. So... 
What do you, what do you think about when you think about stewardship? I know you have some some things to say about stewardship. <laughs> no, do especially I have things, especially from from a biblical perspective, right? So, talk to our audience about you know how how can I view my my uh, my role as a steward and how can I apply biblical stewardship principles in my life? Yeah, well, we we first off have to know what a steward is. A steward is a manager. He's not an owner. And so mm-hmm. right off the bat, you know, Randy Alcorn says this in his Treasure Principle book. You know, God never God never revoked his ownership. Of, mm-hmm. of what is his he's only given us stewardship over it and so we're we're called to represent him and what we steward and that's a big thing that's what bearing god's image means mm-hmm. it means representing him and his rule on this planet and so whether that's uh, our families or that's our our giving uh giving's a big one whether that's our jobs steward means managing that in a way that would please and honor the person who gave it to you you know we we look at the parable of the mm-hmm. talents this is a good stewardship uh, this is a good stewardship, um, you know, parable, yeah. you know, uh, the person that multiplies, and this is not necessarily just about money. This is about somebody who's, you know, uh, taking what's been given to them and multiplying it. And that mm-hmm. can apply to, you know, evangelism that can apply to money that can apply to uh, church growth. It really can apply to a lot of things. So that's not purely a money parable, but stewardship at the end of the day is managing something in a way that honors and pleases the one who gave it to you. Why does why does stewardship so combative to this world's culture? Because, right, it, it's like in this world's culture, we are not really taught to be stewards. We're not we're not we're not uh, entrenched in the ways of biblical stewardship. Right, everything that we hear from the world is saying, you know, you got to own it, and you got to you know. Which I mean, there's there's a good uh, lesson there about taking ownership of things. But sure. but you know, it's like everything everything relies on you, right? It, everything everything comes down to you. Why is it so hard for uh, for this culture to understand, you know, the the role of stewardship? Because I think we're getting pressed on every side about this. Yeah, I think the mind stage that happens at two years old doesn't actually stop. Um, it's it's always you know we, we are always trying to claim what is ours even even with the resources that God gave us I mean even in Deuteronomy eight, uh, Deut- uh, God just speaks directly to mm. the people of Israel through Moses and says, look, you think this wealth is yours, but I mm. gave I I not only gave you the wealth, I gave you the ability to make it. Yeah, they literally can't take credit for any of it. Mm. Now love that passage Deuteronomy eight by the way if you want to read that and yeah. I mean it is absolutely in, in, incredible and and so I think it's hard for us to. Uh, let go of what we think is ours because it's just a poor perspective of who actually owns it all. We, we mm. know all throughout scripture, God is reminding us, it belongs to me. This is meant to bear my image. You are meant to bear my image. It's not even, you're not even your own. Yeah. I mean, he's, he's trying to say, you don't like nothing is owned by you. Yeah. Even if, even if you own property and all that, it's not owned by you. It's, it's meant to glorify God. And so uh, I, I just think it's hard to let things go. This even is a flaw in our tithing strategy, you know, where, uh, somebody might say 10% belongs to God. And I'm like, no, hundred percent. belongs." Yeah. <laughs> to God. But once again, the, the whole idea, like someone can give 10%, but if it's disconnected from the grace of God, you're, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like second, uh, second yeah. Corinthians eight and nine talk about being a cheerful giver. And honestly, mm-hmm. if you're not a cheerful giver, keep the money. Yeah. God's going to provide for his church. Okay. He's yeah. inviting you to participate in something. He's not telling you, look, I'm depending on you to give back some of that money so this church can survive. No, God doesn't need anybody. He's inviting you to participate to show you that his grace is enough. His grace is enough for yeah. you. It's not about riches. That's why he says, be rich in good deeds. Yeah. There's a different currency in heaven than there is in the earth. Yeah, and laying up treasure in heaven. Yeah, I yeah. think stewardship is is hard, especially because we we don't want to it, 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 there's a there's a level of accountability that we have mm-hmm. to submit ourselves under and in fact first Timothy 6 talks about not to be arrogant not to put our hope in in wealth right there's a level of humility and accountability that we have to have when we submit our lives to God and when we submit our finances to God right, right. which is something a lot of people don't want to do and even as Christians it's hard but you know you know Luke talks about the mammon and this world's kind of earthly possession and you cannot serve both God and mammon yep. and I think that's really hard but the really having the heart of a steward and the role of a steward I think is am I am I going to submit myself to mammon yeah. And, or am I going to submit myself to God, which, again, requires that level of humility to say, God, I need your help. I don't know everything. And it also pushes you away from mammon, I think, in your heart. It, 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 I mean, he's, it's true. You cannot serve both God and mammon. So when you push away from mammon and you say, I'm, I'm really going to be a steward, that means you're really submitting yourself to God and being accountable. But there's yeah. a lot of different applications that we can take with that, right? It's like 
if I'm going to give, you know, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's more. I think I think 10% is a sure. good starting point, I right? But, so. I, you know, we're commanded to be generous and, and, and share. Um, but there are other ways that we can be a good steward, right? It's not all about giving. There's also in our spending, right? Are we being good stewards yeah. in the way that we spend our finances, right? Same yeah. thing with investing. Are we being a good steward in the way that we invest? Would God be pleased in, when he comes back? Will he be pleased in the companies that I own in my investment accounts? Yeah. Will he be pleased... In the way that I manage, in the way that my house looks, right? If if God were to come over today, would He be pleased in the way that the appearance of everything is? Are things disheveled and unkept, or are they in in order, right? I believe God is a God of order. Yeah, absolutely. And and in our lives, in our daily lives, right? Are we honoring Him, right? If people were are to view us as stewards of God's resources, would people look at us as stewards and say, "Wow, there's something different about the way that you manage your money." Or the way that you manage your finances and I want to learn more about that or is it more of you look like everybody else in the way that you manage your money uh, you know there's no there's no differentiator so I think there's some yeah. key aspects there that we can really in impart that stewardship perspective into other areas of our lives man yeah I mean you you said it best just stewardship has so much more than giving it has to do with our spending and honestly I just think we, we have fallen short of such an evangelistic opportunity to share our faith through how we spend our money. I mean, mm. Christians, if they've read the Bible, they know that there's over 2,000 verses yeah. on the topic of stewardship, possessions, and money. Mm. And honestly, uh, I, I know that the Bible didn't specifically say that debt's a sin, and so we don't try to speak in that way. But Christians should be among the most biblically responsible when it comes to, to wealth. They, they mm. should be not they should be very little in debt if at any at all they, mm. they should have things paid off they should they shouldn't have the nicest cars they shouldn't have the nicest house because it represents a false priority now it's not saying they can't have nice homes or nice cars you know that's all that's obviously a subjective viewpoint mm -hmm. um, but it's not always about creeping up the next lifestyle now if you have more kids and you need a bigger home that's that's honorable um but i i think christians have the ability you know, when somebody's saying, I'm really struggling in the inflation right now, you know, are you struggling in the inflation right now? And I'm not saying that Christians struggling in the inflation right now are necessarily bad Christians, but, you know, for somebody who says, oh, I paid my house off early, so I think I'll be fine. Mm. Wow. Like, how, how old are you? Like, mm. I mean, I, I, I manage my money because I want to be generous with what God has given me. I don't want to be impacted by the ways of this world. Hmm. And, and we, we look different to the world, just like we, we were talking about in the Old Testament. We look different to the world. So somebody yeah. is in, in, invited to ask us, why do you manage your money that way? Don't you hmm. want to, you know, don't you want to manage like credit and all these different things that the world poses as smart biblically? And it's like, hmm. yeah, look how those guys turned out. <laughs> I mean, yeah, when you yeah. when you talk about debt, right? A lot of Christians will get into this, right? Because the Bible talks about debt in not a good not a good light. No, not right? a good light. <laughs> and so it's like, yeah, no debt. I don't. There's no scriptural basis. To, I think that says debt is a sin, but there right. are a lot of scriptural basis say we should avoid it, right? Yeah. And and I always tell people, and and Ron Blue says this as well with Kingdom Advisors, and he he talks about like debt presumes upon the future of our yes, lives that God has to provide for that, and. I think when we when we are so focused and I, and I noticed this right like going through Financial Peace University which is a great program but when you're so focused on the debt it's hard because again you're kind of inwardly focused and I and I think it's good that you're trying to pay off debt but when sure. debt is become like this just behemoth in your life and you can't really focus on other people again it's just kind of an idol you're just so focused on it you cannot be looking for opportunities to be generous on every occasion, right? Like scripture says, be generous on every occasion. Right. It's hard, it's hard to really look outwardly when you're so focused on like the debt that's burden, that's a big burden to you, right? That's like that thorn in your side. You can't really focus on what's ahead of you. I, I'll just, yeah. I'll just give you this short story. Uh, my daughter was, uh, she just turned one and she's starting to get to the age where she understands what's inside of packages. And so she, uh, she, we were giving her this little oatmeal bar that was, it was in a package. I had one that I had opened, but she had found one and was just holding it. And she was holding it so tight in her hands, like, and just like trying to, trying to squeeze it. <laughs> but she couldn't actually see that I had one open in my hand that I had right next to her face. I mean, it was like right next to her face, but she couldn't see it because she was so focused on this one that was in the package that she actually couldn't even access. And so I kind of use that story as, as Christians, we, sometimes we get like that. We are so focused on, and whatever that is, it could be debt, it could be uh, pursuing uh, money as an idol, it could be mammon. And we, we don't even see that God is right there 
with something in his hand ready to give to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I love the saying, you know, you can't have an open hand to those who need it if you're too busy grasping on to everything that you're trying to preserve. You yeah. know, it, it, it's, generosity is 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 genius in, in God's eyes. I mean, Chip Ingram writes a great book called The Genius of Generosity. And the whole premise yeah. of the book is by letting go of what we're holding on to, we actually embrace what we've been trying to preserve. It's it's absolutely genius and mm-hmm. on God's on God's part, but we we never let go. And mm-hmm. and that's we, we and even with stewardship, we we hold so tightly onto that. But we we have to be willing to let go and, and be willing to say, hey, this is God's and and I have a plan for it. And we, we know the famous Proverbs 16 verse. You know, we, we man plans things, but God establishes his exactly. steps. And I think uh, we can have a plan, but also being open to what God's doing. So it's, I might be saving five thousand dollars for somebody to have a car, but somebody might need a five hundred dollar thing right now. Well, mm. I've. I want to be able to divert some of that to help that. And I can, I can be open to that because, you know, I'm not holding so tightly to my goals for this. Mm-hmm. I'm holding tightly to what God wants. And so yeah. letting, letting your hands be open to that. I think, I think that's what a Christian steward has to live like. Yeah. I think there's, there's a couple of key components, I think of the stewardship part, right? So first is identify, understanding what stewardship is from a biblical yep. perspective, meaning that God owns everything and we're just managers. Second is faith, right? Faith in God that he will provide because if yep. we're not owners of it, that means that God will provide and we have, we have to have faith and right without faith, it's impossible to please him. Yep. Another, a couple of other key aspects I think are uh, contentment, which is obviously a huge issue in, in today's uh, hustle culture <laughs> world. Very much, um, yeah. And, but but I think there's some, and, and obviously generosity, right? Generosity is a huge component of biblical stewardship, right? Because especially if we don't, if we don't own it, and we're supposed to be generous to other people, then we are just basically giving God's resources away to other people and just being a blessing to them. What are some of the other components of you know biblical stewardship that you see from your perspective? Uh, and, and I know you've talked some on the More Than Money podcast about it as well. Yeah, honestly, I think as a faithful steward, we also have to be reminded that, you know, we we are not home. This this version of Earth is not our home, and so mm-hmm. being content is something that is so foreign uh, to to Christianity nowadays. And it's not just Christianity; it's the whole it's the whole world. Yeah. Uh, and and specifically, we talked about you know the hustle culture. We've talked about the 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 hurry culture. Uh, we're, we're so focused on what's next, what's next. I'll be happy when this, I'll be happy when I have this new job or this new role or when my, you know, I hit six figures or I hit seven figures. Hmm. Um, greener pastures. Yeah. Greener pastures. But we, <laughs> we forget the grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener on the other side, either because it's fake or because they've been watering it. <laughs> uh, so, like, you, you don't know what's going on on the other side. It, it could be greener on the other side because of that, but we, we really have to be content in what God has given us. You know, that's that's kind of the basis of humility in the mm. in the Old Testament. There's actually yeah. a word for it called anava. Mm. And the, the word anava in, uh, in Hebrew actually points to somebody being content in what God has given them and what God has given them to do here. So, you know, they're not taking any more responsibilities than they need to, but they're not also taking any less. You know, they're they're understanding I'm here for this purpose and I'm going to do just that. You know, there's mm. kind of this universe. There's kind of this you sized task on the planet. And God has designed you specifically for that. And I think uh, Anavar represents kind of the mindset that we need to have with contentment. And, you know, one of my favorite verses, and I hate how badly it has been uh, dragged through the mud over the years, of Philippians 4.13. Yeah. The idea, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah. We often think, like, that means that I can do anything with God's power. And it's like, <laughs> no, that is not yeah. what that means. If we read that in the context, we know in, ri- in, in, in riches and in poverty— yeah, I can be content knowing that God is in control. Yeah, a base and a bound. I mean, I, I think I, I agree. I think this is one of the biggest scriptures that's taken out of context because really here in Philippians, he's talking about I've learned the secret to be content in whatever yeah. circumstances, right? A base or bound with plenty or with little. Uh, he knows the secret of being filled, uh, you know, being filled and going hungry. Uh, in, in abundance and suffering, he can do all things through Christ who strengthens him. I think a couple of things that I want to point out, though, it's it, right. He says, I have learned to be content, yeah. right? So that's something that's not necessarily in our nature. How do we learn to be content? Man, uh, I, I think you got to, once again, I think you got to be humble and you got to know mm. that your mindset probably not going to be right on that. You know, we, yeah. we talked about earlier, your thoughts are not my thoughts. And, you know, we're, we're born into this world, so we don't know 
just how much materialism is winded into us. You know, it's kind of like a fish who's like, wait, there's water. Like, like that's all <laughs> they've known. That's all that they've known. You know, we we walk by probably three thousand uh, ads a day. Mm-hmm. You know, we are a materialistic world. You are constantly trying to sell each other things, and I mean, it is it is everywhere. And so it's all about possessions. It's all about um, what we're wearing, who we're wearing, or you know, how much money is in our bank account. We it, it's all about success and accomplishment. Mm. We we see this in social media. It's how many followers I have. Mm. Uh, I mean, it's 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 sad to think about. I mean, I was watching a documentary uh, about the uh, you know Paris Hilton, and Paris Hilton sadly still has not learned contentment. Mm. You know, she she's saying my net worth is three hundred million dollars, which is incredible. It's an insane amount of money, and she's the heir of the Hilton empire, and uh, she's a very successful DJ. But she says this, and I think it just highlights something that I've, I've seen constantly and it's, I I'll be happy when my net worth's a billion. Mm. Isn't that, isn't that crazy? Wow. I mean, I saw this, um, from Jim Carrey, he was saying, I, I really hope that people become millionaires. I really hope that they become Hollywood stars so that they realize that money's not the answer. Mm. And, I, and I think he highlights something that most of us will never know. A lot of us will die believing that if we had more money, we would have been happier. We would have mm. had more opportunity to be happy. We would have been more joyful if we had more money. And I think a lot of these people who are making million dollar movies, they're, they're making seven figures on movies or eight figures on movies. They're starting to realize, you know, maybe I was wrong about this. Mm. You know, I'm, I, I have plenty of money and I'm still not happy. Maybe this is not the reason to be happy. And most of us will die believing what they've figured out. And so I'm, I'm not jealous of those people in Hollywood yeah. because they're figuring out something that we, we will never know. Well, I think most people also, you know, they, again, they, they don't look at their life and, and especially in, in what am I doing today in light of eternity, of eternity, right? You think people on their deathbed, they don't think, oh man, I wish I had invested in this stock or I wish I had, you know, done this. They think, I wish I had spent more time with my family. I wish I had spent more time with my kids. I wish I canceled that meeting and went to the soccer practice or, or whatever it is. Like there, there's just so many things. And especially, you know, being a new dad, it's like, there are, there are so many conflicting priorities that um <laughs> that i have to manage right it's like am i gonna am i gonna tell my daughter like no i can't do this because of this i actually heard another, another podcaster talk about basically every time that you say i don't have time instead of saying i don't have time say that you're not a priority and that really yes. hit me because man how many times have i said like i, I told my wife or my uh, you know my daughter you know she I, I think she understands that i'm not there but you know that you're not a priority like that is mm. that's huge yeah. and how many times have i told god you're not a priority right like no. oh i would i would pray if i you know if i could wake up earlier but i you know i just don't have the time or i would pray yeah. you know x y name it you know but i don't have time what yeah. i think and it's really it's really convicting even as i'm saying it, it but is, even yeah. thinking like man i you're not a priority like saying that out loud like oh god i would spend more time with you in the morning but you're not a priority like that's that's hard or like I would yeah. give more but God you're not a priority right like or I would be a blessing to that person but you're not a priority like me having more in my bank account is more of a priority and that's a hard yeah. shift to make in the mindset of a believer I think so I, I heard a story that we did on the radio show and it just kind of highlights how, how God works in these scenarios where uh, there was there was this mom that was struggling and the kids in the back seat were saying hey mom I want ice cream and you know the mom maybe had like seven dollars on her it was like look I, I I need this money we need to we need to pay for a meal uh, and and then the kids said um, the kids said no God's gonna provide and then you know it's like a six year old kid so it's like yeah. okay that's that's sweet that's that's nice you know faith <laughs> like a child that's cute uh, but then the mom got home. And she found a $125 check in her mailbox. Mm. And it was from an overpayment on a student loan she made seven years ago. Wow. <laughs> so not only did the kids get ice cream, the mom got food and they <laughs> made a donation to an organization that they cared about. Wow. And I, I thought, man, isn't, isn't that just a staunch reminder? Like mm. we, we hold so tightly because we think like, I'm, I've got to provide, I've got to provide, I've got to provide. And, mm. and we forget, no, God, God provides for all that you need. Second Peter one three. I've given you everything you need for life and godliness. Yeah. Nothing less. Nothing more. Philippians talks about, uh, you know, Philippians talks about, um, you know, God will meet all your needs according yeah. to His riches and glory. Mm. Let, let's believe that today. Let's yeah. let's believe He's going to meet all of our needs. And and mind you, in our culture, we have a hard time saying what's a want and what's a need. <laughs> mm. you no, know, like I I want to be able to pay for this Direct TV bill. You know, this month it's like. 
that's not a need, man. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just we, we have a hard time discerning those things. And I think Billy Graham talks about that saying, you know, our, our culture's biggest lies that we've, we can't discern the line between mm. ones. And these. So I, I think that's huge. Yeah, I think uh, Second Corinthians talks about um, my grace is sufficient for you, yeah. right? And, and the power is perfected in weakness. There is a level of, I think, in right. The qu- the question is always how, how much is enough, right? And in mm-hmm. and, and the scripture, my grace is sufficient. I, I think about like how much is enough. Well, if God's grace is sufficient in our lives, then enough is what we have right now. Yeah, and, and and that's hard because right, especially as a financial advisor, right, we're helping people manage their money with investments, with saving, with giving, there is a level of, I just want one more, like you mentioned, like one more million or one more billion or one Mm -hmm. more year, right? When I was pretty deep in the financial independence movement, it was always like the, called it the golden handcuffs, right? Just one more year or, or one more, one more investment or one more flip or one more rental property. It's like, it's always just one more and then I'll feel content. But as, as we've talked about, like, it's never just going to be enough, right? Unless we actually, you know, humble ourselves, submit ourselves to God and just submit to his grace, right? Uh, Second Corinthians talks about my grace is sufficient for you. Many times we're going through life and we're not really relying on God's grace uh, Mm -hmm. every every day. And I think this is something that I struggle with as well, right? How how can I, how can I truly rely on God's provision and God's grace for today? Because when I'm so focused on the worries of tomorrow, right? A lot of times we're so fearful and, and anxious about tomorrow, but we're commanded not to be anxious about anything, but to put, but to put our hope in God. And so, yeah, I think anxiousness and, and humility that there's a, if we're not humble towards God, we're anxious about our own lives because we're not putting our hope uh, in, in God. And Proverbs 19 talks about the fear of the Lord leads to life. The one who rests content, untouched by trouble. And when mm-hmm. I think about that, it's like, man, that's, that's the place where I want to live. That the fear of the Lord, another, another proverb says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Yes. So if I if I just trust God and and am humble towards Him and really fear Him and and reverence Him, then that leads to life, that leads to contentment, untouched by trouble. And I think and, and this ties back into what Paul is talking about. I've learned to be content, whether abased or abound, with plenty or with much, or sorry, with plenty or with little. Um, this this proverb talks about I'm untouched by trouble. I don't think it's because the trouble doesn't exist. I think it's because we're just not phased by it. Yeah, man, that, that was what we were talking about earlier, you know, having a non-anxious present in the workplace. You know, it's not a it's not a reality that we're, uh, you know, we don't have to ignore what's going on around us, but we refuse to be shaped by that. We we understand like, yeah, it, it, it sucks right now in the world, you know, but uh, I'm not like this is not all there there is. Mm. This is not all that there is. And so I can find comfort. And that's, that, that's what hope is. Mm. You know, faith is, you know, believing what God has done in the past and, and believing that to be true. And hope is believing what's ahead because of that faith. Yeah. You know, you can't have one or the other. And so I, I think, um, you know, contentment is so key. I think this, this is particularly true when we look at our credit card statements. Uh, you know, and I'm not saying that everyone who's in credit card debt is necessarily in consumer debt. I know that some people have medical stuff and sure. that's just something that, uh, that's just something that's hard to deal with. Um, but, you know, when we're, we're constantly looking at consumer debt, whether it's a car I can't afford or it's, uh, you know, a, a Kohl's card or, you know, whatever. I'm not picking on Kohl's. I'm just any dead card for that, once. Like, yeah, dead, dead for yeah. once. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, we're, we're sort of telling God what you've given me is not enough. And, and when we look at it that way, when, when I spend, uh, you know, when I spend money I don't have on a credit card for something that I don't need, yeah. I'm telling God what you have given me is not enough. Yeah. That's a that's a big thing for me. That's a convicting thought. Mm. Yeah, I think that goes back to humility, right? We're not we're not submitting ourselves to God and 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 in not submitting ourselves to God, we're telling him whatever you've given me, it's it will never be enough. Yeah. And that that ties back into having a heart of contentment because when we're so focused on our own satisfaction, our own blessings, our own joy, right? We never have enough to give either. We never have enough to give to be a blessing to other people. So I think that ties in pretty well. I want to talk just, this just came into my mind, but if you're like for single people, this might be, this might be easier. I'm not sure, but for married people, right? I've been married uh, close to nine years now and you've been married about the same. Um, And we have, we have, we both have one, one kid. Um, for married people, how do you how do you talk to your spouse about contentment? Because now you're dealing with two different hearts, 
right? And that that per, that spouse might want something, and and you're trying to stick to the budget, or or you might want something, and they're trying to stick to the budget, and you're trying to you're trying to you're trying to be content in your satisfaction with each other, but also with the things that God's provided. So how do you how do you manage contentment with a spouse? And I mean, I, I'm lucky that my wife is probably more frugal than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> this isn't a conversation that I have to have too much of, but I've had that conversation before where uh, things have been tight and my wife wants to wants to spend money that we don't have. And honestly, it's just finding realignment, reminding ourselves, you know, of a common of a common goal. You know, mm-hmm. it's it's like this is this is really hard if you marry a non Christian and all that because you know you don't have a common textbook of morality and, yeah. uh, and uh, of life guidance. Uh, you, you, I mean, one person reveres the Bible as the w- word of God, the other doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully you're in a situation like that. But, you know, we, we go back to what God's word says. Why, why are we here? Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, this usually we're, when we have those conversations and we're aligned on the goal, you know, we're, we're aligned on generosity. This doesn't mean we don't have fun. It doesn't like I'm not having this discussion every time my wife wants to go to Chick-fil-A. <laughs> but it, it's like, <laughs> you know, I really want this and I don't want to give because that money could go to us. You know, mm-hmm. we can have this discussion and sure. remind ourselves. You know, hopefully you've had that discussion of why you're here, but sometimes it's just a simple reminder. And sometimes my wife has to give me that reminder. Mm. Sometimes I have to give her that reminder. So it's a nice, you know, uh, equally yoked relationship. Mm. And I think um, when we root ourselves in God's word, we get closer to God's word uh, and we get closer to God. You know, we, we see that triangle demonstration. You know, we both get closer to God we yeah. both get closer as a result. Uh, yeah. And so that's usually how I would handle that discussion. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty good. I think especially when you're <laughs> when you're equally yoked to your spouse, right? That that their desires and your desires might not be the same. Yeah. Um, but I think when you focus back on God and what is God's heart on biblical stewardship, what is God's heart on contentment, what is God's heart on our work as worship, right? Then you have a moral standing to make your case, right? Because it's like, does yeah. this please the heart of God? And then there's some alignment there. Uh, before we let you go, Taylor, I just I want to hear kind of a little bit more about your story. How did you get so passionate about biblical stewardship? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I um, I was on LinkedIn one day and somebody was giving away somebody from Ramsey Solutions was giving away a free FPU kit. And this mm. you know, was pretty expensive for somebody who was like 21, 22 years old. Um, so they gave me a free kit. It was like one hundred and thirty dollar value. Uh, and it came with, you know, a complete guide to money. And I kind of just put it in the corner of my closet mm-hmm. for a few months. But then my wife bought me the total money makeover. And that's what did it for me. You yeah. know, I really, I really realized that we we were just out of control. We weren't like, a, we, you know, we didn't have a ton of debt at that time. I mean, mm-hmm. I had an $8,000 student loan. And that was that was all I had. We were in an apartment, but I got really passionate about it. And then we moved in a home and I got really stupid. And so I financed a bunch of stuff. So I financed a bathroom remodel, I financed a three thousand dollar refrigerator. I still had this, uh, you know, I still had, uh, you know, I financed two cars. I did this all in the span of like two years. <laughs> so I had this like I had this like sort of moment of I, I give up. I want to be happy. Um, but then I got back into those those books again and I started reading people like Larry Burkett, Ron Blue. Uh, I started reading um, Art Rayner and Dave Ramsey, and they just all had a common theme. You know, we're not we're not here to, like we're not here hmm. to, to grow our barns, uh, and and really just this this uh, mindset against debt and and towards generosity. That's yeah. all all of them had that mindset. We're we're here to be generous with our resources, and so hmm. it was a convicting thought for me. My wife and I ended up paying off forty three thousand dollars in two years. Hmm. Uh, paid off our cars, the student loan, the bathroom. Uh, we got into a home and. You know, man, it, it's been in, incredible. I've been reading so much more books, got connected with art a few years back, and now mm. we do this podcast. I coordinate FPU classes whenever my church hosts them. I mean, it's it's been awesome. I've even set up budgets with some people who, you know, might be entering adulthood, so get to really invest in a next generation of finance, you know, telling them yeah. to, to be cautious about debt, to avoid it when possible, and to to be passionate about giving. Even if, even if it's a non-Christian, I still tell them, look, it's good to give. Even if you're not a Christian, there's scientific yeah. evidence that backs up. Giving is great for the brain. It's great for your body. It's great for your joy and happiness. And, and they really appreciate that. So they end up investing in causes that they care about. So even if it's a non-Christian, it may, it may be harder to convince them why to give, but uh, even non-Christians appreciate the generosity factor. 
Yeah, I think uh, when when you're when you are giving, you get to see there's a, there's a double benefit, right? You feel better about yourself, right? You oh, I gave, right? But there's also a benefit, and there's a joy of generosity that you get to experience, especially if you're very closely tied to that person or that organization. You get to you get to see the joy that they get from the gift as well. Uh, but for those people who are not familiar with uh, you know more than money or the maybe the eight, the money milestones, you want to share a little bit more about the more than money podcast and kind of the framework y'all take people through. Yeah, it, it's a uh, we have a eight money milestones. This is headed up by Art Rayner, and he actually is now doing some big things, uh, creating his own sort of uh, product. And so be be on alert for that in the fall. But in the meantime, if you're on Facebook, join the More Than Money with Art Rayner group. They have about 750 members. David's a member. I'm a member. Uh, we got a lot of financial counselors in there as well. And it's just a great time to ask questions about, you know, biblical finance. And, you know, this is a very non-judgmental group. You know, mm. this is not arguing over debt and all that. We're, we're very much wanting everyone else to succeed. And so yeah. on Facebook, join that. We're also on Twitter and Instagram and uh, Facebook, just search Art Rainer. If you want to follow me personally, I don't post a lot of money stuff. I'm mainly into spiritual stuff, but uh, I'm at TB Standridge on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And so, yeah, that's a, that's uh, about me. Well, thanks, Taylor, so much. I really appreciate you uh, coming on the podcast and uh, really excited for our guests to learn more about more than money and, and art as well. Uh, so really appreciate you being here. Uh, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here.